Okay, um, good afternoon everyone. Um, thank you for waiting there and, and more importantly, thank you for joining us today for this webinar, um, which we're here to talk about the non-habitual residency scheme in Portugal, uh, uh, the NHR as, as you, you may know it. So, um, very brief introduction of where we're doing great one shortly. Um, my name is Matt Pemple, advisor and director here at Pollution Wolf, and I'm here with my colleague and, and managing director, Paul Correa. Um, so I will just cover briefly the, the agenda we set today. So we'll start with a quick introduction of, of who we are um, and a, a little bit more about how we operate. Um, then we'll cover some brief introduction and, and um, background information on the, the NHR Portugal scheme. Um, from there, we'll move on to um, really the, the kind of first stage of, of, of the process, which is exit in the UK, uh, which also covers the issue of, of UK domicile and, and the planning surrounding that. Um, from there, we'll, we'll move on to, to visas, the tax benefits of, of NHR, which is obviously a kind of huge part of, of the attraction of, of the scheme, and also the tax planning opportunities that, that go along with that. We will finish off with a little bit of detail on um, capital gains tax on, on UK business disposals, some frequently asked questions that, that we come across, and um, a little bit more advice and key advice for, for, for those of you relocating, which I expect is, is the majority of you today. And at the end, we will have the, the Q&A session. So um, you're able to ask questions throughout the webinar, um, which you can type these in. I would urge you to, to input these questions as, as, as soon as you're ready. We will wait to the end to, to answer, but if you can get those ready, and then it allows us to go through those um, at, at the webinar at the end. So um, yeah, we, we'll start with, with who we are. So um, I hand you over to Paul, Paul Career, as one of the founders of um, Fiduciary World. Can you introduce yourself and, and the company? Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Um, I started my career in the Inland Revenue in 1984. I transitioned into financial services in 1989, and I've been working in the private banking wealth management sector for the last 33 years. I'm a chartered banker by profession. And as Matt mentioned earlier, I co-founded Fiduciary Wealth in 2007, together with my partners, who are the owners of the longest standing Bang One law firm in Gibraltar, um, established in 1892. Besides our legal roots, Fiduciary Wealth are also a member firm of MGI Worldwide, which has its origins in Surrey in England, but has mushroomed into a top 20 global accounting network. In fact, it's one of the oldest networks. It was established in 1947. And today it's represented in um, 460 countries uh, across seven continents, more than 10,000 professionals driving one billion dollar in revenue. So we've got, besides being a traditional wealth management practice, we've got legal and accountancy rules. Our mission is all about positively shaping the wealth of the expatriate community through tax-led wealth management advice. I'm a great believer in the need to engage in a broader dialogue to provide uh, to develop deeper relationships and provide more client focused solutions. I'm also, by the way, a strong advocate of the need to offer experts holistic, tailored, and impartial advice and advice which stands the test of time. Okay, thank you, Paul. And, and just to follow up on that, you, you talk about the advice that, that we give to experts. So, um, can you talk us through the, the differences in, in our approach to, to serving clients abroad? Well, that, that's a really good question, Matt. I was recently invited to, to join a panel of speakers in London to discuss financial and lifestyle considerations for British expats moving abroad. And a fellow panelist of mine who happened to be a direct competitor was asked to introduce himself. And his message was all about 
the company's in com uh, company's growth story, and there was an integral focus. There was no mention of, of the clients it serves. And let, let me say that that's not a criticism. Far from it, they have built a very successful business focusing uh, on internal um, on, on, on internal aspects of the business. Uh, and good luck to them. But it did make me think long and hard about our purpose, about our values, and about our mission. And um, you know, if, we, if I had to describe ourselves, I would say we have a family office approach offering a highly personalized service in which each and every client relationship is highly valued and is important to us. So relationships are the heart of everything we do. We have a long-term focus, so we preserve our clients' legacy for the futures and the futures of those who depend on them. We are absolutely passionate about shaping the wealth of the British expatriate community through tax-led wealth management advice. And then ethics is, is a core value. We do things for the right, we do the right things at the right time for the right reasons. And, and our mission is, is very simple. We want to help expats and their families. Uh, I've been asked in the past to, to sum up in a few words what it is we do. And I would say it's all about service, it's about helping, it's about caring, and it's about supporting the clients that we serve. And it, it, may, it may sound terribly simplistic to you, but that's who we are and, and what we stand for as a firm. Wonderful. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, so the, the NHR, um, the scheme, um, I'm sure a lot of you have, have, have done your own research and, and you're aware of, of the scheme and, and, and some of the details, but of course uh, there's a lot of, kind of misconceptions out there, which hopefully we can clear up today. But a, a, a bit of a kind of background, so the NHR scheme was established in, well it was created in 2009 and then implemented in 2010. And the purpose of the scheme um, was for, for Portugal to, to attract wealthy individuals um, to, to their country. And they offered this tax scheme that they created as, as a carrot to, to attract people. And, and there were, of course, multiple tax advantages, which I'm sure you want to hear about today, and, and we'll certainly get to those shortly. Um, the NHR is, is offered for a 10 year period. Um, key conditions of that, and, and the, these are some things that people miss. Um, the, the name non habitual residents, that confuses people. Um, because they feel they don't need to live in, in Portugal, whereas that's not the case. Um, to take advantage of the scheme, you have to be a Portuguese tax resident, and, and that means spending 183 days or more in the country during that tax year. The non-habitual actually refers to the fact that you haven't been a tax resident in Portugal before. So if you've been a tax res resident in Portugal in any of the previous five years, um, that would disqualify you, I'm afraid. Um, so that's a, a, a about the, the scheme. And um, firstly, we, we, we talk about, and when we talk to a lot of clients, we, we talk about their journey um, and, and when they start to be kind of planning the process. Um, and, and the first start of that is, is the UK and how to exit the UK cleanly and um, how you can return them to the UK and what the restrictions are. Paul, if you can tell us a bit about that, please. Well, there are many different factors which will determine whether you're a tax resident or not. And the number of, the, of days you physically spend in the UK during a tax year is an important consideration, but it's not the only factor that one needs to consider. Um, you also have to think about other things like the pattern of your presence and your connections to the UK, which can include everything from family to property to working life to social connections. The UK State Free Residency Test 2013 allows you to plan the date in which you become non resident and determines how much time you can return to the UK during a tax year without re triggering residency. This is a tricky bit. You have to consider how many times you have that will determine 
days you can come back. And that can change normally after year three. One of the ties will drop off, which allows you to spend even more time in the UK. It's always advisable to exit at the end of the UK tax year, which is on the 5th of April, simply because it's a clean break, which is ideal. However, you may decide to split the tax year between the UK and Portugal. And there are three specific situations where split year rules will apply automatically otherwise guidance is required and and you know the three things are you're starting full-time employment overseas your spouse or, or your partner is starting work overseas or you seem to have a uk home so that would allow you effectively to um to um opt for the for the uh, split year um you have to bear in mind that even if you have a clean break from the uk on the 5th of April, that Portugal's tax year runs on a calendar year basis. So there was always a degree of overlap and it's never as simple or as clean as, as one would like. Okay, thanks Paula. And um, one thing that comes a lot, up a lot is, is UK domicile um, and, and how that affects one's inheritance tax position um, regardless of post kind of relocation. So, Paul, please tell us about that. Well, well the good news, and I, I don't think I'm a bearer of good news, but because you, you will be well aware uh, of non habitual residency and the advantages that it provides. And you know, or most of you will know, that there's no, new, there's no inheritance tax in Portugal for direct descendants. So, that's great news. The bad news is that you're likely to remain in the UK exposed to UK inheritance tax, as in the UK, you know, inheritance tax is based on the concept of tax, it's not based on the concept of tax residence, but rather on the concept of domicile of origin, which is completely different to tax residency. Most countries, um, UK and Ireland are probably one of the few exceptions, they base it on the concept of domicile. So you remain subject and potentially liable to UK IHD. And the, the domicile of origin is something you acquire at birth and is normally taken from your father if he was born in the UK. And whilst you can claim and acquire a domicile of choice by settling in, a com in another country with the intention of living there permanently, let's say it's Portugal, um, this is often fought with difficulty as there are no fixed rules and the burden of proof will always fall on you to prove that you've acquired a new domicile of choice. In my experience, or in our experience, uh, it's not uncommon for Brits to move abroad only to return to the UK temporarily, if the, for reasons of ill health, or more permanently if one of the spouses were to sadly pass away. So, and, and that in itself would, would of course, um, re-trigger UK domicile. So, theoretically, yes, you can avoid UK inheritance tax after five years of non-UK residency, but in practice, it's much more complicated than that. And ties such as business interest, social ties, family interests, and property, and something which we call intentions the all-encompassing clause can result in someone being considered still domiciled for UK inheritance tax purposes. And even insignificant ties can be challenged. HMRC have been known to rely on the most tenuous of grounds to dismiss claims that the domicile of choice has been acquired. I think the most to try and, and, and bring this point, um, to emphasize this point, the most high profile case uh, being the, uh, one from the Welsh actor now deceased Richard Burton. And uh, Richard Burton lived uh, for many years in the US before moving to Switzerland in, 1980, in 1957. He spent the next 27 years as a tax resident of Switzerland living in Geneva until he passed away in 1984. He had had good tax advice on how to sever his UK domicile. 
Unfortunately, the UK tax authorities uh, made uh, a claim on his estate on the grounds that he never relinquished his UK domicile, notwithstanding the fact that he had severed his ties 30 years earlier. And they did so on the basis that um, his intentions were always to return back to the UK. They successfully claimed that since he had purchased a burial plot in Wales, he had emotional ties and always intended to return to the UK. Apparently, um, his request to be buried in a red suit, I guess with a red dragon, with a copy of Dylan Thomas' poems did not help his case. As a result of that, his worldwide estate of 5 million was subject to an inheritance tax bill of 2.4 million. So it's not as simple as one would think. And uh, one will always needs to um, plan on the basis that you could be deemed UK domiciled. So it's better to be a bit cautious. The one good thing I can tell you is that being a non UK tax resident, does provide you with tax planning opportunities to restructure your assets in such a way where you fully mitigate or partially mitigate UK inheritance tax. And in some instances, you could uh, completely um, uh, avoid uh, UK inheritance tax in a perfectly, perfectly legitimate way. So there's ways of addressing the issue in a legitimate way. But uh, you know, our advice is always to tread carefully and to move forward on the basis that you could be deemed UK domicile and therefore you have to plan for a UK inheritance tax liability. Thank you, Paul. Okay, great. So um, we'll move on to visas. So um, uh, for those of us who are Brits, this is a, a relatively new concept when it comes to moving to, to, to the EU. So for, for those who are listening who uh, EU nationals are holding the EU passport. Congratulations! You, you, your process is a little bit easier than those of, of whose don't. But um, unfortunately, post Brexit, we do now require a, a visa to relocate to to Portugal. In, in fact, um, recently I spoke to a very lovely couple planning their new life in, in Portugal. Recently retired and. and really the start of their planning phase and, and they wouldn't get the impression they could jump in the car, pack all their belongings in the back of the car, make that drive, an incredibly long drive, and, and start their new life in, in Portugal. But if only it was that easy these days, which it isn't. So um, we do require visas and, and really there, there are three main types which, which I will cover briefly. So uh, the first is, is the golden visa, which unofficially is, is known as the investment visa. So as, as the name suggests, this requires an investment in Portugal to, to qualify for, for the visa. Um, historically, this has often been um, achieved by a uh, purchase of, of housing property, retail property, in the sense that it kills two birds with one stone. You, you have your lovely new home to live in in Portugal and, and it helps it achieve the visa. Um, now, Portugal has recently, as, as, as many of you will see, introduced new guidelines with that, which means the qualifying property cannot be bought in, in Porto, Lisbon, sorry, Lisbon, and the majority of, of the Algarve, which makes it vacant and restricted for those. So there are other options as, as well. Um, one of those is investment via a uh, Portuguese investment fund, um, which there are quite a few interesting ones out there. Um, a lot of these are invested in um, the underlying investments of a property. Um, a, a minimum of 60% has to be in Portugal. And, and one of the funds that, that we've, we've researched and, and is interesting actually offers the investor the opportunity to use the property um, in return for, for less growth for a yield. So there has that option with, with the golden visa, um, but it's important to know um, you're making the right investment um, that qualifies, but also suits your circumstances and is something that we're happy to have a, a kind of individual conversation with those of you who, who wish to do that. 
Um, now, the key difference with the golden visa and, and other visas is there's no requirement to spend a certain amount of time in, in Portugal, um, which is great for those who, who want to achieve that, but then it doesn't tie in with NHR. As, as we said earlier, NHR, you have to spend 183 days there. Um, so regardless of the visa type, you, you still need to spend that time there. Um, the, the, the second visa, and, and probably the most common, is, is the D7 visa, uh, which is known as a passive income visa. Um, generally aimed at kind of retirees are, are those who can work remotely. Um, the, the D7 visa requires you to prove that you have a passive income that can sustain your lifestyle in Portugal with the theory that you won't be a burden on, on the, the, the state. Now, um, this passive income is, is usually achieved by rental income, um, pension income, uh, dividends, and, and the threshold to achieve this is, is relatively low. 7,620 euros for an individual and 11,430 for a couple. It does tend to go up each year, but generally in line with inflation because it's, it's there to match the, the minimum wage in, in Portugal. And then the final visa is the D2 visa, which is aimed at entrepreneurs and, and professionals looking to establish a, a business in, in Portugal. Now, it's not a straightforward process. Um, you do need to uh, submit a business plan. You do need to uh, prove that you have the financial resources to support the setup and, and, and the growth of the business. So it is a tricky one to achieve. Um, it can be done for someone in, in that position. Uh, the one thing with the, the D27 visa is, I've heard it referred to as the, the digital nomad visa before, which, which isn't correct really. It's, it's not suitable for, for those who have a remote job and, and, and want to work elsewhere. For those individuals, they need to probably look at the D7 and, and see if they can qualify by the kind of passive income requirements. So you, you know what visa you, you need, you are aiming for, for residency, so you want to understand those all important tax benefits of, of NHR, which are, are quite incredible and, and fairly unique amongst European countries. And, and we, we see a huge amount of, of interest in, in, in people moving to Portugal, whereas maybe historically people were more focused towards Spain, but the purpose of attracting people to, to Portugal is, 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 is clearly working for them. So to, to cover the tax benefits in, in brief, any employment income in the, in, earned in Portugal is taxed at a flat rate of 20%. Um, we'll cover this briefly later, but, but the employment has to come under what is categorized as a high value activity. Um, pension income is, is taxed at a flat rate of, of 10%. Although there, there is a um, possibility that this can be structured and, and lowered to only 1.5%, and, and we'll cover shortly how we can achieve that. Um, foreign sourced income is exempt from Portuguese taxation um, as long as it's deemed taxable where the income is, is generated. And then we have the taxation of, of dividends, and, and, and this is a, a kind of key attraction of, of NHR. And, and, I guess at this stage, I, I should add that um, NHR works in connection with the double taxation agreements it has with countries around the world, of which it has 79. And one of those is, is with the UK. So if you are in receipt of a dividends from, from your business or uh, maybe investment, there is a, a, a kind of unique agreement that comes via the, the double taxation agreement between the UK and Portugal in the fact that as a non-UK resident, the UK deems that they do not tax it and has derived in the UK that the Port Portuguese deem it not taxable for them. So the end result is, is potentially zero taxation on, on dividends, which can be and, and has been an incredible um, saving for, for, for people we've helped in the past. And then the, the, the last part I want to cover is, is capital gains. And um, the reason we discuss capital gains is, is it's the one place where NHR is, is overlooked. There is no exception exemption for capital gains. 
um, and, and they're taxed at a flat rate of, of 28% in, in Portugal. That's within the NHR scheme or outside of it when your 10 year period is, is over. Um, so what comes with that? And, and we talk about kind of planning um, a, a lot. And, and this is where we've got to be smart and, and, and use opportunities to reduce capital gains and, and other taxation using products that are available. So one of these is um, the QROPS, which is a qualifying recognized overseas pension scheme. Um, often these are, are, are homed in Malta, which again has a double taxation agreement with Portugal. So QROPS is, is funded by a transfer of your existing um, UK pension. And this can benefit you in a few ways. So for those who are um, close to or even over their lifetime allowance limit, um, which currently stands at just over a million pounds, um, as you know, if you breach it, you may not know, as you breach this limit, um, there's taxation on this on the excess of, of 25% if taken as an income or 55% as a lump sum. If you transfer your pension before you reach this limit to a QROPS, then what happens is what they call a benefit crystallization event. Your pension is tested against this limit. As long as it's under, there's no taxation. And then once your pension is transferred, it can continue to grow with, with no taxation to, to follow that. Um, another huge benefit, and, and I touched, touched on this briefly, is that the income can potentially be structured to just 1.5% um, on the income payment. So that's 1.5% tax on income received from pensions via a QROPS. Um, this is because, because of Portuguese law relating to these, uh, which deem only 15% of the income um, is due to be taxed. So 15% of it is due to tax. That 15% is, is taxed at 10%, which gives you the effective rate of, of just 1.5%. Now it's important to, to, to specify that it's, it's, um, these need to be structured correctly. The income needs to be paid in a certain way. And, and again, like many of the points that we covered today, um, we're happy to have a kind of chat on a one-to-one -one basis with, with anyone who feels that they, that may be suitable for them. And then the final advantage is um, your death benefits. So in the UK, if you die after you turn 75, 75, your beneficiaries will pay tax at their marginal income rate on, on that money. If you have a QROPS, as long as the beneficiaries are your direct family members, um, other beneficiaries live outside of Portugal, then there's no taxation on, on that inheritance at all. The second um, tax planning product that, that um, could be of interest to you is, is the QNOPS. So this is a qualifying non-UK pension scheme and, and sometimes referred to as the pension, sorry, the sister scheme of, of the QROPS. Very similar in the sense that there's no capital gains, um, there's no taxation um, on, the, on your beneficiaries regardless of, of the age that you pass away. And the income from a QROPS, again, like a QROPS can be structured, so it's taxed at just 1.5%. So again, 1.5% taxation on income derived from that. Um, the QROPS differs slightly from the QROPS in the sense that it's funded by a lump sum investment, whereas a QROPS is funded from a pension transfer. Now, the beauty of a QROPS is that any contributions paid into it are immediately outside of your estate for UK inheritance tax. So Paul talked about UK inheritance tax and, and how you relocate to Portugal and you remain UK domicile or you may return to the UK at some point. So this is a very clever way of, of planning and, and um, planning it against that. So that would be immediately out of your estate, even if you return to, to the UK. Um, the key part of that is, is the QNOPS must be set up as a genuine retirement vehicle that's in line with your wealth, age, and future income requirements. And, and what we mean by that is, is if you've got somebody with a state of, of 2 million, 
they can't just put the full two million into a QNOS. That would be an inheritance tax fudge. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for smart ways to, to reduce that liability. Okay. And then the, the final one is the Portuguese component. Can I just add the point? It's forcing. I think a very pertinent point at this stage is that Portugal has some very quirky rules on how it taxes pension income. And it depends whether it's funded from retirement savings or, and, and then it distinguishes. So, for, for instance, in, in terms of QNOPs, which is funded from your retirement savings, then it would be taxed at one and a half. Correct. Yeah. But if it's a QROPs where you've, you've transferred UK pension benefits across um, from, a, from a UK pension scheme into a QROPs, then the tax treatment of pension income will depend on how meticulous the Portuguese tax authorities are in assessing the origins of those pension benefits. So the rule state, and it's not always followed and observed, is that any um, pension benefits that, have been, that are sourced from an employer-based scheme where the employer is contributing towards the pension, then those and the QNOPs will generally tax at 10. But there will be instances where, and this is where it gets a bit cloudy, there'll be instances where the employee is making contributions, but also the employee has contributed towards the scheme. So it remains to be seen how it's treated, whether they distinguish between the employer contributions and the employee contributions and then treat them differently for tax. Correct. Right. Or whether um, you know whether you had a, for instance, a company-sponsored pension scheme, which you subsequently transferred to a SIP under your own name, and, and many years have elapsed, and then the transfers from the SIP to the QROPs, in which case maybe the tax authorities in Portugal don't go as far back and treat it as a retirement savings scheme. So it, it, it is a bit of a gray area. And the tax could be 10, or it could be one and a half, or it could be somewhere in between. Am I right in saying that? Absolutely correct, yeah. Yeah, so there's a bit of ambiguity in there. Um, the QNOPS is, is, is pretty clear, whereas uh, the QROPS, it, it really depends on those details that um, Paul just covered. Um, so the, the, the next um, uh, product that, that we can talk about is the Portuguese compliant bond. And, and there's a lot of interest in this because in the UK we are used to ISAs and things like premium bonds, maybe they're the UK bond where we get the, the, the 5% withdrawal, um, whereas in, in Portugal there's, there's never really been a, an equivalent, um, whereas uh, very, uh, very recent to the market is, is the Portuguese compliant bond and, and it's really the next best thing we have to an ISA. So an ISA is great, you, the money is in there and, and it's outside of your estate, but there are limitations on, on how much you can put in a year. Now, a Portuguese compliant bond is, is a single life premium insurance contract, and, and this is a wrapper around a, a portfolio of assets. So the investments can be made and, 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 and the bond sits around these. And, and the beauty of it is there's, there's no immediate capital gains. So we talked earlier about the 28% capital gains. There's no capital gains immediately, and the um, any taxation only takes place when a withdrawal or a full surrender takes place. Now, this is a 28% immediately, but then uh, the Portuguese compliant bond works as in the longer you hold it for, then the taxation on that reduces down, um, which when you reach eight years, it's, it's reduced down to 11.2%. So it's really um, created for those people don't have an immediate need to cash, wish to find a, a home for this, which is um, uh, suitable for, for them as a Portuguese resident, and we'll maybe look into kind of draw on it at, at some later date. Another thing to add is, is when you do make a withdrawal, the, the bond provider is, is able to pay that tax directly to the tax authorities for you. So from an administrative point of view, that's nice and easy as well. Matt, can I just have the point? I believe that one of the other advantages is that, the, but you have to correct me, is that the Portuguese bond 
can be endorsed and it will return to the UK. It can be flipped into a UK bond, which if you add a discounted gift trust or a loan trust, has certain advantages for UK IHD. Correct, yeah. So they call it portability. Yeah. Um, Paul, but that's completely correct. They, so it's so, so a Portuguese compliant bond, um, but if you do return to the UK, this can be effectively converted to, to a UK bond. Um, so it's a nice feature in the sense that it's, it's tax compliant for um, you in Portugal. And, and even if you intend to stay there for a long time, if, if your circumstances change and you move back to the UK, um, yeah, it, it can be flicked back over to, to a UK compliant bond and, and the tax advantages. And again, there's some very smart tax planning, a lot of it which you just um, listed, Paul, that, that comes in handy with that. Um, so I've, I've, so we provided a, a kind of brief diagram of that based on a 50% gain of, of over um, eight years. You follow this all the way down and, and only the gain is taxed at this 11.2% rate, which generates an effective rate of, of 3.73. Now, um, the, the QNOPs and, and the Portuguese compliant bond, um, they are very useful for those who have a lump sum who are looking to invest, but, but there's another way that they can come in. And um, a bit of a kind of a scenario that we're not used to in the sense of we sell our main property in the UK, and as long as it's your main property, there, there are no capital gains. This is not quite the same in, in Portugal. So if you sell your main property and you reinvest in, in another property of the same size or higher value, then there's not a problem. But if you sell your main property and don't buy a new property, or sell your property and purchase one of lower value. So we're talking about people who downsize, which is a, a natural step as, as we, we get older. Then there is um, capital gains tax to pay on that of 50 percent of the gain, um, but there is a relief available, and, and the rules dictate that if somebody reinvests those proceeds in a qualifying long-term savings plan, which the Portuguese compliant bond is, or a qualifying pension scheme, which the QNOPs qualifies us, then that capital gains doesn't take into a plan. So for those who are downsizing property, it's, it's um, a, a good way of avoiding the capital gains that come in on Portugal in that. And there are also some conditions, which mean that the investment needs to happen within six months of the property sale going through. Um, but yeah, there's a, a, a nice way to kind of use those products. Okay, so we've, um, yeah, we, we've moved on to part three and, and the treatment of UK pension transfers and, and taxation of pension income. So we, we've talked about the, the QROPs and the QNOPs and, and the potential to um, have income paid at one and a half percent or possibly 10% depending on, on the scenario. The, the third option um, we have is, is an international SIP. So an international SIP is, is very similar to, to, to what we used to have in, in the UK. Um, offers that flexible access to the SIP offers, but also has that added benefit that um, you can hold um, the underlying investments in multiple currencies. Um, you can have the income paid out in, in euros as opposed to sterling. So as you move to become a, 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 a Portuguese tax resident and want to kind of align your, your finances and, and, and plan your spending, which inevitably moves into euros, then um, yeah, that is something that, that you can kind of take advantage of. Um, and then we move on to the next point, and, and we covered capital gains tax and, and the difficulties in the sense that the, this 28% um, still applies even under the NHR. So um, Paul, what about those with maybe a UK business that they're looking to, to dispose of? What options do they have? Well, that's an interesting one because, as you rightly point out, non habitual residency is a fantastic scheme, tax residency scheme, which offers so many different tax benefits. But there's one weakness in the scheme, and that is that whether you are tax resident under NHR or you are just a normal Portuguese tax resident, uh, capital gains tax is charged at a rate of at a flat rate of 28%. 
There are ways of circumventing that tax, but it involves mobility, international mobility. So let's say that you were to move to Portugal in 2022 and become a tax resident and the NHR for 10 years. NHR gives you the possibility to suspend your non habitual residency for a period, and that could be a year or two, in which case you, you go to Portugal, let's say in 2022, and in 2025, when you are about to dispose of your UK business, which has a value of, let's call it 5 million, and you would be subject to 28% tax, which would be roughly a million and a half. At that point in time, you can decide to suspend your non habitual residency in Portugal and move to a country which has no capital gains tax. So let's give you a practical example. You move today to Portugal, the tax resident in 2022, 2023, and 2024. In 2025, you dispose of your UK uh, business interest and you move to a favorable jurisdiction. And because we are specialists in the Iberian Peninsula, Gibraltar offers certain advantages. So in 2025, you become a tax resident in, Portu in Gibraltar. Of course, there's the issue of the tax years not being aligned. You know, the UK from April to April, Portugal is a calendar year, Gibraltar runs from 1st of July to 30th of June, but you come in, and you become tax resident in Gibraltar, you dispose of your UK business interests, you pay zero capital gains tax. And then you stay for a while, 12 to 18 months, and then you return to Portugal and you resume your residency under the non-habitable residency regime. You have now disposed of your UK business interests, paid no CGT, and continue your journey under the non habitual residency regime. Admittedly, you will forfeit maybe a year, possibly two, but if we're talking about a saving of one and a half million, then it's something that you should consider. So there's always ways of, uh, yeah, fine tuning, tweaking around to, to maximize the tax benefits. Thanks, Paul, and um, that's, that's great. And so we move on to frequently asked questions. So this is a combination of, of questions that we, we've come across um, quite often before and, and some that have been um, submitted be, before this webinar. The, the first one I'm just going to answer very quickly, which is ties in very nicely to, to what Paul has just spoke about, which is can someone take a break halfway through NHR? So the answer, as you guess by what Paul spoke about, is, is yes, you can. The, the only caveat with that is, is the clock doesn't stop. So you are you have the 10 years of the NHR, and that's from kind of day one until 10 years from that date. So to, to give a, a, a very simple example, you spend three years in Portugal, you spend two years maybe in, in, in Gibraltar, you return to Portugal, you only have five years of, of, of the NHR left. Um, rather than the, those eight years. So again, it's, it's important planning, taking advantage of, of, of the tax advantages um, during that period. Um, so I think we've got a few more questions for this. Yeah, yeah, so, um, okay, let me see, sorry. Um, sorry, that, you have to excuse me. Um, Ah, yes, the NHR scheme is a very general scheme and one which is not replicated across the EU. Um, and in fact, it came, NHR came under scrutiny from the European Union and they had to, um, they had to lessen the benefits to make it EU compliant. Um, could the tax scheme be changed again or the scheme be abolished completely because you know that Cyprus and I think Malta have come under and attack from the EU and have had to to uh, to end the schemes. I believe. Yeah, no, I I think it's, it. yeah, it's a very interesting question. And, and um, in all honesty, of course, we can't give a definitive answer to that um, because there, there may well be pressure um, because of the generosity of the scheme 
Um, and, and as Paul rightly said, there was pressure before and, and, and there were changes. So um, you may know um, when the scheme was originally set up, the pension income taxation was 0%. Um, so there was a lot of pressure on this and, and this was increased in, in January 2020 to um, 10%, which is what we see now. But what we can learn from that process, and um, we could argue there's a precedent set, is, is that our clients and, and individuals who had secured their NHA status before that change, they still receive their pension income at, at 0%. So we can't say we're, we're full confidence, but if we, we look back on history and what's happened, um, if there are changes to the scheme, um, we said maybe it, it, it wouldn't be that unlikely. But if there are changes to the scheme, if you are already within the scheme, it's, it's very unlikely that you will lose um, those advantages that, that, that you've already built up. One more question. How does one qualify for non-habitual residence? Okay, yeah, good. So um, it's relatively, and we say relatively straightforward. Of course, there's bureaucracy involved and, and, and applications, um, and it depends on, on your individual requirements. For those who have gone through the visa process, a lot of the visa requirements are similar to, to what you require for any child in the sense that you need suitable accommodation, which can be rental accommodation with a contract of 12 months, or it can be a, a property you own. Um, uh, we covered earlier, you can't have been a tax resident in the previous five years. For those retiring, then that meets the, the qualifying criteria. For those still in employment, it really is um, dependent on, on your occupation and, and if it is categorized on, under the um, high value activities, which um, OG is classified. So again, those individuals in that situation, um, we, we, we can discuss that and, and, and look at that. Um, when we talk about the qualification, we also talk about timing. Um, so the deadline is, is very clear with NHR. You need, to, um, you need to achieve this by the 31st of March of the year following you become tax resident. So in very simple terms, you become tax resident in 2022. You've got until the 31st of March of 2023 to, to achieve this. Um, the reason for that is, is it's a um, calendar year tax year in, in, in Portugal, and um, you, you have to start submitting your tax returns from the 1st of April. Um, and, and one thing that we, we don't tend to cover in this presentation, but because it's a presentation of, of, about NHR, is, is, is people often ask about, okay, how does taxation work after NHR? And, and that's quite simple from a residency point of view. We've got to remember that the NHR is a tax scheme, not the residency, so that is unaffected. What happens after your 10, 10 years is, is, is very simple. You move on to a normal Portuguese taxation. So Portuguese income tax is, is similar to, to what we are used to in the UK in the sense it works on progressive tax rates. These work on an upward scale that start from 14.5% um, all the way up to 48%. Um, and what happens is you will be taxed on, on your worldwide income, um, opposed to those kind of exemptions that, that come with, with NHR. Um, so that is, is a frequently question, but Paul, allow me to ask you kind of one, what I think is a very important question. So what is one piece of advice that you would give anyone looking to relocate to Portugal? Well, I find it a difficult match to limit myself to one piece of advice because it covers multiple aspects, but it's, it's essentially the same thing. I think it's always about the road, leaving one country for another. You need to have a trusted advisor by your side that can make the journey easier for you and ensure that it's a smooth and seamless transition to a new country of residence because there's pitfalls along the way. Um, in my experience, um, failing to plan is planning to fail. You really need a timeline, you need a strategy, and you need an advisor that can help you execute it. And you have to follow steps. If you miss some key steps, then, and you're not properly advised, then that could have some costly 
consequences further down the line. And sometimes you can do them, but other times you really uh, cornered yourself. Um, I, will, I would always advise to plan first and move later. Uh, and planning really begins before you exit. So it's at conceptual stage. Um, and it's okay to be the tortoise. And, and there's no need to be ahead, right? Um, this is not a race to the finishing line. It needs to be executed correctly. And, um, and finally, Matt, if you allow me, I would like to go back to the issue of UK inheritance tax, because I think it's a very relevant issue and one that needs to be addressed in almost all cases for Brits exiting the UK. I think when it comes to UK inheritance tax, it's always advisable to plan for the worst, assuming that you're liable and hope for the best so that a negative posthumous determination by HMRC does not reduce the inheritance of your children, like it did for Richard Burton, right? So plan for the worst and think that you're always UK uh, liable, uh, that you're liable for UK inheritance tax. And then if you structure your investments and your assets with that in mind, you can never go wrong. Perfect. Thank you, Paul. Um, and, and then finally, we um, we get to the roadmap, and, and this ties in actually very nicely with, with what Paul has, has been saying, and really a, a bit of a kind of a theme of, of this webinar, in the sense that the, the planning is is so key. Um, we've come across so many individuals who have failed to plan, and, and they come to us, and, and okay, I've, I've been tax resident in Portugal for a year now. What can I do? And, and of course we can help these people and, and we, we do help them. But unfortunately often we, we have to say to them, look, we could have done even more if you would have planned in, in mind. And, and with a relocation, it's, it's a step-by-step -step process. So we, we have the roadmap and, and we, we say, you know, plan with the destination in mind. So you, you know where you want to go, you know what you want to achieve. Well, here's how you can do it. So. Um, we, we, we advise people follow this, this process, gather your information, review this information, discuss your problems, fears, pain points and concerns. You need to understand what you need and what you require. You need to identify your sources of income and, and then the tax taxation surrounding this. Um, you need to consider the amount of time you intend to spend in various countries. We talk about returning to the UK or even third countries. Evaluate the viability of what you're looking to do. Consider the UK exit strategy. Review the UK statutory residency test, which, which will determine that time you can spend in the UK. Discuss UK domicile. Look at your potential UK inheritance tax. Identify these miti mitigation techniques. And, and then you have that security that you know you've planned and, and there's no bumps in the road for you. You need to consider the re res residency and visa options review these, establish which is the best fit for you, understand the tax planning opportunity that undoubtedly comes with NHR and, and clarify this process. Of course, then you need to source your property that you need to gain residency and, and mortgage finance if, if you requires that, address the healthcare requirements that often come with the, the visa applications, then you're ready to apply for the visa, then you need to consider the impact of the change of residency and your assets and liabilities. And because you've taken all these steps and planning, you're in a great position to, to look at that with a clear mind to know exactly where you stand. And then the final point is, is do a full review of everything, your pension, savings, investments, protection policies as well, which are, are often overlooked. And make sure you've got kind of sufficient cover, sufficient... Um, resources in, in place to, to, to make sure that you will enjoy this kind of dream of life in Portugal that, that you will, of course, want. I, I think just one, one point on, on your last point concerning the protection policy, the thing to, to keep in mind is that when you change residency, you might lose continuity of cover. So it's, it's really, really important that you review those protection policies and you know, engage the services of a professional that can review them and determine whether you have continuity of cover or not. And then liaise with the 
with the underwriters or the insurance brokers uh, to ensure that you know you haven't got a life policy that, that doesn't actually pay out should an event occur, whether it's critical illness, uh, income protection, or, or or death. Yeah, no, absolutely, it's, it's very important. Thank you, Paul. Um, so yeah, we we reached the end. Um, I hope that's been very useful for, for everyone. So we've invited questions and and. I, I can see a, a few on there, so it's possible that some have been covered as, as we've been going through it. So, um, so uh, from going there, I'm keen to learn about how you leave the UK from a tax residency perspective as well. This seems to be less straightforward. So, I, I think we've covered a large part of that, Graham, and, and it's a very good question and, and, and very valid because. Um, People often overlook the importance of, of exiting the UK in the right way and, and tidying up the affairs there and, and, and doing so with, with HMRC. So I, I hope we've added some kind of clarity on that. Okay, I, I can see the, the, the second question, which seems to be kind of very specific about your individual circumstances from Manil. Um, so maybe Manil, it might be good if we have a, a kind of one-to-one uh, -one conversation about that. So, so please get in touch and, and hopefully we, we, we can help. Um, and again, Graham asking about the kind of UK residency test. So I think we've covered some details on there. Um, the importance on there is, is that um, a lot of people think that you can um, return to the UK as much as possible, or you have 183 days to return to the UK. That's not the case. The, the, the UK statutory residency test, that dictates this, and, it, and it's based on the number of ties you have to the UK, as, as, as Paul covered earlier. So this is based you know, on, on things like the, the property you have or, or the work you do in the UK. And, and naturally, these ties tend to kind of shed the longer you're out of, of, of the UK and, and therefore you, you can spend more time. But it's important and when we talk about the roadmap to really review this well in advance so, so you understand completely how much time you, you can spend in the UK. OK, so... Um, uh, Christine has asked about the NHR scheme we've scrapped, so I, I think we've, we've um, covered that towards the end and, and asked if we will share the webinar presentation. So, yeah, we, we, will, we will do that. Um, we will be able to provide a link. Well, then let, let me go back to Graham. Uh, yeah. In terms of Graham, I think Graham will do provide a service if you want to go through the UK State University test to establish how many days you can trip back to the UK comfortably without a triggering residency. So uh, that's something we can we will happily do if you contact us after this uh, webinar. And with regards to Christina, um, you know, if history is anything to go by, um, since NHR has been uh, modified following pressure from the EU, I think what we've seen in the past is that it's not done retrospectively. But, but they give you some notice, they don't have to, but they probably give you notice that affected from the following calendar year or whatever, there will be some changes to the scheme. But I think it's already been scrutinized by, by the European Union. And they look at every aspect of the scheme to see if it's consistent with the, with, with, with the European Union tax rules. And if there's no tax to pay, obviously that's a no-go, which is why it came under fire. It's been looked at carefully and they've been asked to make certain changes to make it compatible, which they've done. So can it come under fire again? Possibly, but unlikely, I would say, given that it's already gone through the, the yeah, through, through the um, audit. No, it's a good point, actually. They, they've had um the pressure and, and they've made the changes and and, uh, and we forget that's over two years ago now and, and uh, no kind of further pressure has, has come on that so of course we, we can't say for guarantee but in a way it's quite nice that we've already seen that the scheme has gone through that process 
and, and there have been changes, but it still remains such an attractive scheme. And, and um, so, yeah, I, I think that's a good answer, Paul, in the sense that that would be quite unlikely. Okay, and, and wonderful. So um, that's the end of the. Oh, I could do one more question. I ah, just. Okay, Mark has a question. Would, would the UK pay dividends from a limited company being tax free and then they try? I think we did cover that. I believe so. And it was taxing rights because of the way the double taxation agreement works between the UK and Portugal, in non likelihood you would pay zero tax. So I think that's that's the answer, Mark, to, to your question. And then there's another one from Monique. Yeah, I think this is regarding the timing. So he's asking if you register um, for NHR by the following March after moving, is the tax exemption backdated to original to your actual moving date? Um, which is which is correct. Um, so again, I use the example: you become tax resident in 2022, so this year. Um, you obtain NHR by the 31st of March 2023. And then your tax assessment is then done between April and June of 2023, but this covers the calendar year of, of 2022. So what I'm saying is that you obtain the NHR and, and as, as, as you achieve that, then that would cover that year for you. Now, the, the, uh, the only way you could go wrong with that is if you trigger tax residency and don't reach the NHR by that deadline, you've already become tax resident in that year and you would fall under normal Portuguese taxation. So um, again, the same example, you become tax resident in 2022, you don't achieve NHR by March 2023, you still will be assessed as a Portuguese tax resident in 2022 under normal taxation. And that would be a bit of a kind of double whammy because A, you'd have to pay at normal taxation rates, but also because you become a Portuguese taxation, you lose that right to apply for NHR for, for future years. So again, you know, that's where the, the planning and, and preparation and, and, and making sure it's all done is, is, is there. So yeah, hopefully that answers that question. And it's, it, it's not unusual for individuals to miss that deadline of 31st of March. And because they become tax residents under normal rules, it closes the door to achieving non-habitual residency. It does happen more often than we think. Yeah. There's more questions there? Yeah, sorry, there's a few questions that have come in the um, chat section. Um, okay, I can see a question from, from Clive, which again, um, it seems to be based on, on your individual circumstances. I, I think, Clive, please um, get in contact and we, we can discuss that with you. The there, yeah? Sorry. Should we go through all of them and try and see which ones are answerable and which ones are not? Of course, yeah. So, so again, there's, there's somebody asking about the, the slides, which um, we intend to, to, yeah. to, to share by email. So, um, the email address you've registered on, we, we, we will send out a, a, a link to, to this for you. Um, okay, there's a question about the, the delays in the um, appointments of um, in Portugal. And, and this is something that I've been discussing with, with people lately, actually. And, and this is more regarding kind of the residency in the Portugal, so not quite uh, appropriate here, but there has been de delays by um, SEP processes. Um, so again, and, and I, I hate to repeat myself, but again, with the planning that comes in here, because they, they've come out with a statement that's saying that you have the four months to gain your residency, but um, and, and that if you register, because they do have a backlog, if you register for your appointment to achieve that, then you effectively kind of secure your right to, to, to stay in the country to do that. Um, so, 
So what happens if you inherit a, a UK property after obtaining NHR? Um, so I, I'm not sure, uh, Mike, is, is what kind of part of that, the, the question kind of um, applies to if it's a, a UK property, then we're talking about inheritance tax. So the inheritance tax would, would be covered in, in, in the UK because it's, it's the estates that, that would pay the inheritance tax. Um, if you're talking about kind of rental income, if, if you have that UK property, then um, and it's an interesting question because we didn't cover this uh, properly. That the rental income is is um, because it's it's UK property. You will continue to pay tax on that in, in the UK, but due to the double taxation agreements, um, there'll be no further taxation um, in Portugal under the NHR. And I, I assume that if there's any, if you dispose of that property, you know, within say six months later, it would be the capital gains from the from the day that you acquire to your disposal. Yes, that's that's how it should work in in, in the UK. Yeah, correct. Okay. So, what questions? Okay, so so Clive is asking. Um, and not to reveal your story to everyone, Clyde, but um, they're moving to Portugal. They own a number of residential um, properties in the UK as well as commercial property. Will this affect my domicile? Um, I, I think the answer to that one, Paul, is, is yes. Is, is that it, it potentially could, but I think this is one where um, Clyde will need to engage with us separately because it becomes very specific to your to your situation and we need the full brief to understand what the potential problems are with any no yeah I, I would agree with that but i guess holding that property certainly remains a connection with the uk which which would make it very difficult to shake off your your domicile um so you have the next question I yeah I, I do to qualify for a golden visa must you buy Portuguese health insurance? Um, the answer to that is a, a simple one. You, you do need the um, healthcare cover as, as part of the application um, for the golden visa. So the answer to that one is, is, is yes. Kai then has another question, but I think again, these are very specific Correct. questions where we would need further background information to be able to answer. Then we have, Faiza, Pisa? Yeah. Well, that's a very, very simple answer, uh, Faiza. Um, you would be liable to um, to have against tax in the UK rather than in Portugal because if the asset is an immovable asset, which is based in the UK. And whereas prior to 2015, the rules stated that if you were a non-resident with a UK property, there was no capital gains. They changed the rules in April 2015. So if you dispose of a UK property while it's Portuguese tax resident, you're liable to UK capital gains tax only on the upside from April 2015 onwards. Yeah? Correct, yeah. Mark? Okay, Mark, so there, there's a few questions in there. Um, so is it permissible to transfer to Kios only the portion of, of the pension that is within the, the LTA? Well, um, it's it very rare that the, the pension will allow a, a part transfer. It's possible you could transfer a part of a pension to the, the QOPS. The, the danger you have there is the proportion that you don't transfer to the QROPS, that will still need to be tested for your lifetime allowance at some point. So if you transfer part, the, the bit that you remain is okay, you, you may not 
and pay the lifetime allowance tax charge on that, but you will when the benefit crystallization event happens, which is one of many things when you take income. Um, the final one is when you reach 75. Um, so really and truly in, in that situation, it, because your pension is likely to continue to grow in, uh, grow in value, if you are over the lifetime allowance, it would still probably make more sense. And again, we need to look at this on an individual level, but it would probably make more sense to, to transfer out. Of course, there might be a hit on the tax, but then further growth won't be taxed. Whereas if you retain some of the pension benefits in, in the UK, um, that could happen. Um, but again, we, we we're more than happy to, to uh, speak to you on an individual basis on that. Um, you've asked about uh, the UK SIP and, and um, benefits at the 1.5% tax on, on that. That is not possible. The, the way the, the benefits are structured wouldn't qualify for, for, for that. And um, you asked about what would switch into a QOPS. QNOPS mean to upfront and ongoing fees and, and for choice of, of, of investments. It's a very specific question there, Mark. So again, I'm more than happy to, to arrange a conversation. Our, our team can make contact or please make contact with us and then we can we can call that one for you. Yeah, we, Mike will provide you with a copy of the slides. I think Clive, we've established that it's better that we speak separately, yeah, because you had quite a few questions which need to answer. Okay, and, and that question from Monil, I think, was on the question and answers yeah. and, and on the chat. So, exactly. Um, I, yeah, I hope we covered that one. Um, so yeah, that's that's all the questions. I'm, I'm really grateful for everyone's kind of engagement and. and Hopefully we've been able to clear up a, a few of those issues. Um, as ever with this process, it's, it's, we, we like to provide this information, but um, everyone has their own individual circumstances and, and, and that's why they, they need to follow the process, but also you know, take the, the required advice and, and assistance which we, we can offer to you. Um, so yeah, no, thank you everyone for attending. Paul, is there anything more that we need? No, I think we've covered a lot of ground. Thank you for for having registered for the webinar. I hope we've added considerable value. And if you have further issues, concerns, or you want to engage our services, you know where to contact us. Wonderful. Okay, well, thank you everybody. Um, hopefully we will speak with you all soon. Um, and yeah, have a wonderful afternoon. Okay, bye. Bye.